Coming up on today's show, Nissan gives us an official response to the Rapidgate DC quick charging debacle. Tesla's Q1 2018 estimates show it set new records for production and deliveries, and why BMW may not be continuing the i3 or i8 beyond current generation models. These stories and more coming next. Another Friday, another jam-packed show covering the week's news in the world of cleaner, greener, safer and smarter transportation. So let's get started with an update to the 2018 Nissan Leaf Rapid Gate story. As some of you may remember, some owners of second generation 2018 Nissan Leafs have been complaining that their cars suffer massively restricted DC quick charging power after the second rapid charge session on a long distance trip. While Nissan Europe initially said it was looking into the issue, examining vehicle logs of affected cars, we heard back from Nissan North America this week with a very different take on the issue, specifically that charge rate restriction was a normal part of the Leaf's battery management system designed to reduce battery wear and promote long battery life. I won't go into the details here as I've already produced a video on this channel about Nissan's official response. But it does seem that Nissan hasn't designed the Leaf to be used on long distance trips beyond one or two times the car's single charge range. I should note too that other electric cars do seem to power restrict as well, including the Volkswagen e-Golf, but none seem to be quite as severe as that carried out by the Leaf's battery management system. Electric bus company Proterra, which unveiled a dual motor variant of its Catalyst full-size passenger bus late last year, has just released a video showing how capable it can be. Providing a total of 510 horsepower, 380 kilowatts, the dual motor Proterra Catalyst E2 Duo Power has already proven itself capable in terms of long distance range. But this week, Proterra released a video of the bus undergoing winter testing on some of Utah's steepest hills. Not only did the bus manage all the hills with aplomb, climbing 5 and 10% inclines up to four times more quickly than a diesel competitor, but it also managed to climb a 15% incline at city speeds, something the diesel bus just couldn't accomplish. With Proterra's order books heaving, it's likely you could see one of its electric buses in a city near you very soon. Last week marked the end of the first quarter of the year, and in keeping with its tradition, Tesla published its estimated, but usually very accurate, delivery and production figures for quarter end. Combined, Tesla managed to produce a record number of 34,494 vehicles, with just under 10,000 of them being Model 3 sedans. Of those vehicles, it estimates just shy of 30,000 cars in total were delivered to their new owners. While these figures aren't official and shouldn't be treated as such, Tesla also added into its press release the snippet that Model 3 production crossed the 2,000 unit per week milestone and seems to be heading towards 3,000. Additionally, Tesla reports Model 3 reservations remain stable throughout the quarter, but does note that some cancellations were received, mostly due to delays in production and delays in the availability of certain build options, like all-wheel drive and the smaller battery pack. You'd be forgiven for thinking that filling stations make the majority of their money these days from selling you petrol or diesel. But as it happens, most petrol stations, both urban and rural, make the majority of their money from other services, such as an attached convenience store, village shop or garage. And this week we heard from the National Association of Convenience Stores in the US, which is starting to worry that the transition to electric vehicles will kill off the very services which make filling stations profitable. Citing a recent Morgan Stanley report, the group says that stores will need to find new ways of competing in the world of plug-in cars. And given many chains across the world are already starting to offer EV charging as part of their filling station services, and some already even have a coffee shop, I think there's an obvious business model they can follow. What do you think? Following a fatal collision involving a Model X, which occurred a few weeks ago in Mountain View, California, Tesla has confirmed that Autopilot was engaged at the time of the collision, but also added that the car's onboard system had warned the driver several times before the accident happened to take control of the vehicle. At the same time, however, several other owners have posted videos online showing their own Autopilot-equipped cars swerving towards similar crash barriers on their own morning commutes igniting some serious discussion on forums and in the media as to what really happened. As I mentioned in a special vlog I made this week on the subject, however, there seems to be multiple factors which played a part in this particular collision, but it's essential for everyone to work together to understand what really happened and to make sure it doesn't happen again. 
With the end of March came the usual monthly sales figures for the US, showing that GM sold just shy of 1,800 examples each of the Bolt EV and Volt plug-in hybrid, while Nissan managed 1,500 Leafs and Toyota managed almost 3,000 Prius Prime sales. But while those figures show we're out of the winter doldrums, they also come with the news from GM that it will no longer be giving monthly sales totals for vehicles, instead choosing to quote figures once a quarter, just like Tesla does. GM says it's because monthly sales figures are more volatile than quarterly sales numbers and don't really represent trends. Consequentially, we're either going to have to guesstimate sales of GM EVs next month or wait until July to find out the exact numbers for those three months. This week, as expected, the head of the US EPA announced it would reject official corporate average fuel economy standards set by the previous administration, standards which had called for fuel economy of new light passenger vehicles to average 50 miles per gallon by 2025. Essentially rolling those standards back, much to the joy of the automakers who had lobbied for such action, the less stringent EPA targets will make it easier for SUVs and pickup trucks to meet fuel economy targets without resorting to hybrid, mild hybrid or electric drivetrains. The net effect? quite possibly a reduction in investment in cleaner vehicle technology, although with the rest of the world still pushing for zero emission futures, that might not be how it plays out. EPA or not. Nikola Motors, the company that's going head-to-head -head against Tesla in the zero tailpipe big rig market, has announced it will be returning all customer deposits for its Nikola 1 and Nikola 2 trucks. No, it's not going out of business. It's a clever marketing ploy that goes straight after Tesla, which is currently taking a $20,000 deposit per Tesla semi-ordered. Tesla, as I'm sure you know, really does need those deposits to help it refine and ready the Tesla semi for production. But Nikola Motors claims it doesn't need customer deposits to ready its hydrogen fuel cell truck for market. Instead, it says customers will get a full refund of any deposit placed thus far, and they'll also get to keep their place in line. Given Elon Musk doesn't like being shown up, I'm eager to see what Tesla's official response will be. Five years ago, as part of its commitment to promoting hydrogen fuel cell vehicles as one of several zero tailpipe emission forms of transport, the state of California set itself a goal of having 100 hydrogen fueling stations operational by 2020. Yet, just as registrations of hydrogen fuel cell vehicles have been something of a disappointment to hydrogen fuel cell fans, so too has the rollout of filling stations, with last Friday seeing the official opening of the 33rd hydrogen filling station in California. With only two years left and only one third of the target number met, hydrogen fuel cell stakeholders have a lot of work to do if they're serious about meeting that 100 station goal. Then again, with a choice of only three hydrogen fuel cell vehicles available and registrations low, it's very much of a chicken and egg problem that may have investors playing a very long game indeed. Norway's love affair with plug-in vehicles just keeps continuing to grow, with the latest figures from Norway showing that plug-in vehicles accounted for 55% of all new car sales during March, with pure electric vehicles accounting for 37% of all new cars sold. That's great news for the nation known for becoming the world leader in EV adoption, but its neighbouring Scandinavian country of Sweden is finding Norway's insatiable EV appetite a little hard going. And that's because a large proportion of the second-hand plug-in market from Sweden is being snapped up by Norwegians eager for a great deal on a plug-in vehicle. That in turn, says Sweden, is impacting its own EV push, since there are very few used EVs available for those who can't afford to buy a brand new plug-in car. If you're a Swedish viewer, I'd love to hear from you about how difficult it is or not to buy a used electric car where you live. Staying in Europe, French automaker PSA announced this week that it's about to set up a special low emission vehicles business unit tasked with, among other things, developing a portfolio of plug-in and electric vehicles for Peugeot and Citroën, as well as the recently acquired Vauxhall and Opel brands. The reasons are a little complicated, but at the heart of it seems to be an ongoing battle between PSA and former Opel and Vauxhall parent company GM. PSA alleges that GM misled it about the extent of the emissions compliance challenges that the Opel and Vauxhall brands faced in Europe, and, if it can't produce a lot of cleaner vehicles, may find itself looking at massive fines for non-compliance due to missing tight CO2 targets. The Opel Ampera E is, of course, one way to help PSA avoid those fines, but at a loss of nearly €10,000 per car, it isn't sustainable either, hence the founding of this new arm within the company. Details are sparse right now, but as always, I'll let you know more information when I have it. 
It's been a while since we've heard from Virgin Hyperloop One, but this week a few stories overlapped that warrant mention here. First, in the presence of the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, Virgin Hyperloop One unveiled its latest prototype pod, a full-sized Hyperloop capsule showing how far the company has come in such a short time. Second is news of a reshuffling of the company's board of directors following the departure of three directors, suggesting that there's some internal startup turmoil chewing through execs and staff in typical Silicon Valley fashion. If that wasn't enough, a fourth board member was arrested in Russia this week, charged with embezzlement and fraud, although I should note that these charges have nothing to do at all with Hyperloop One. Finally, after many years of resisting the call from its customers, Renault has begun to offer French customers the chance to buy their cars with a battery pack included, rather than force them to rent the battery pack. Battery rental was part of Renault's grand master plan when it launched its quartet of electric vehicles back in 2011, but over time, more and more European countries have begun to offer Renault EVs with full battery pack purchase as an option for those who don't want to pay extra rental every month. It's not clear why Renault held out on not offering battery purchase in its home market of France, but if you're a French customer, rest assured you can now buy your Zoe avec pile compris. For some time now, there's been an ongoing discussion over what's next for BMW's iBrand of electric vehicles, especially since BMW seems to be ready to fold electric and electrified vehicles into its main BMW and Mini brands. To date, we've heard of several possible outcomes, including the addition of two additional models in the form of the i4 and iNext. But this week, Automotive News suggested that BMW is still trying to decide what it will do with the i3 and i8 when the current model production ends. While eye-catching and essential in the development of BMW's portfolio, BMW officials now suggest that the i3 and i8 will be axed in favour of developing platforms that can accommodate a variety of drivetrains, including all-electric variants. While sales in Europe of the i3 remain strong, it's worth noting that the i3 hasn't done so well in North America, and it's also not an SUV, a market that BMW seems eager to electrify in order to go after Tesla. And finally, most of the electric cars we cover on this show are ones that are designed and built as electric models at the factory. Occasionally, however, we cover converted vehicles, such as the all-electric G-Wagen converted by Austrian firm Kreisel. A company well known to Arnold Schwarzenegger, it even built a plug-in Hummer for him, the specialist shop has unveiled its latest creation, a fully operational all-electric fire truck. The result of two years of planning, the tactical fire engine has entered service in Linz, Austria, and packs an impressive 86 kilowatt hours of power on board to enable it to operate in many situations without any range anxiety. Now, if only we could get some of those around here. And that, as they say, is your lot for today. I'll be back next week with more cleaner, greener, safer and smarter transportation news. But in the meantime, don't forget to like, comment and subscribe. Hit the notification bell. And as always, I'd love it if you consider supporting the show through Patreon. Or if you're so inclined, send us your Bitcoins at the address in the description below. I'll be back soon with more awesome news. So all that's left for me to do is wish you a great weekend. Thanks for watching. And as always, keep evolving. Thank <laughs> you.